Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another very special episode, Advent episode of Ignite Radio Live. You are with Greg and Stephanie Schleter over the five mighty stations of Annunciation Radio. Welcome to this new season of Advent. And our pastor, Monsignor Borger, really asked a great question in his homily this past Sunday. Are we just going round and round these liturgies, right? Advent leads to Christmas and we get into Lent and Easter. And uh, do we just keep going through year after year without going further? It's a good question for us to ask. You know, how different are we going to be next year at this time as a result of the commitments we make. Below the surface of those ordinary human important things, what matters most? Our speaker tonight, who is a Hillsdale Dean, really addresses this question from the vantage of grace. It's not about critical race. It's about critical grace. It's not about our skin. It's about our sin, he speaks. In a few moments, you're going to hear this tremendous episode concluding our year of Belief and Beverages Nights. We are all in in marriage and family becoming the foundation, the cornerstone of civilization, supporting marriages and families. Please go to massimpact.us forward slash partner and consider partnering with us in this great mission. See the great work that's been done this past year and uh, see some of the dreams, the hopes that we have going into next year. Now with no further ado, on with our program, our final Belief in Beverages Nights featuring Dean Jeffrey Rogers on Critical Grace Theory. If you have not heard of Hillsdale College, you should really look into it because what they are about is really cornerstone of civilization kind of stuff forming us to understand the best versions of ourselves created by God in a setting that fosters that with extraordinary professors and community. They have their issues like everything else. I don't want to paint a utopia, but it really is an extraordinary place. Uh, We have two children who are there, and I have a brother who's there. Some of you may have heard him as a professor a couple weeks ago, a couple months ago. Um, and if you want to hear past talks from Belief and Beverages, we are blessed that some of them are willing to come in and, and share with us and teach us. But you could find that at massimpact.us forward slash BNB. Great talks. So reserving the last talk, we're not going to do Belief and Beverages next month. It's just a little busy, and we're focusing on presents for Christmas. If you were to ask students, and my son being an RA, one of them, what, how would you describe our speaker? Uh, I would think that one of the most accurate descriptions would be set up by C.S. Lewis, who said, every person we come into contact with, by virtue of that contact, we will either lead closer to Christ or further away. And they would say very strongly that you cannot not encounter Christ and be brought closer to him by contact with our speaker tonight. He is I'll just read it for you from this point, but very blessed to have him here with us. Jeffrey Rogers is a native of East St. Louis, Illinois. He's number 13 of 15 brothers and sisters. Jeff enlisted in the United States Navy straight out of high school. He served with both Marine and Naval units in Operation Desert Shield and Storm and Operation Iraq Freedom. Additionally, served as Chief Hospital Corpman, Naval Hospital, I'm going to get this wrong. Yakosuka. Yakosuka. Okay, like I said, Yokosuka, Japan. And he gave me another one. And Keflavik. Is that right? Keflavik. Keflavik, Iceland. This is all about humility. Pray the humility prayer and you get to do what I do. (laughs) Jeff retired from the Navy in 2011. He holds a BS in cytotechnology. Did I get that right? From the U.S. Army School of Cytotechnology, he is married to Roma Rogers, and they have two sons, Uriah, who serves as an Army Ranger, and Micaiah, who is a Hillsdale graduate. Jeff currently serves as the Associate Dean of Men at Hillsdale College. Would you please join me in giving a warm welcome to tonight's speaker, Jeffrey Rogers. All right. Uh, Good evening, everyone. Thank you for inviting me. It's a uh, can you guys hear me? Yeah. It's a pleasure to be here in the great state of Ohio. I bring you greetings from Michigan. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I'm not originally from Michigan, so I, 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 don't, I don't get the, uh, the back and forth with Michigan and Ohio. But I've been here for 10 years, so I get it now. 
So, so good evening, though. It's good to be here. It's a good crowd. Uh, nice looking crowd. Uh, I know the Sleater's kids. Uh, Catherine's very beautiful, takes after her mom. Uh, the son, that's another subject. <laughs> In fact, I just saw him uh, prior to coming here and I talked with him. But I asked Catherine, hey, you got any info you could share with me about your dad? And she gave me a laundry list. <laughs> so kind of stuff that I did as a dad that only dads would get, so I leave it at that. Uh, but I wanted, to I wanted to talk with you and share with you. Uh, I, I just visited another college. I'm at Hillsdale and the associate dean of men there. And I just visited another college. And I had to reevaluate what I wanted to share with you in light of my visit at this other college. Um, and this college um, has dangerously bought into critical race theory. And uh, it has affected not only this college that I visited, but also the town. And I must tell you what I experienced at this college that I visited. And I'm sure that this is uh, not specific to that college, but unfortunately, uh, it's plaguing a lot of our colleges. If you are in the market of looking for a school for your son or daughter, it's a dangerous world out there. Um, this affects communities all over the land, unfortunately, here in America. Uh, communities that make up towns that ultimately make up our states which makes up the great United States of America. Uh, I, uh, when, I, when, I, when I get to help at Hillsdale, I get to help develop young men and women, more importantly, men. I'm the associate dean of men. <laughs> you know, so, so we say, like, boys, they kind of say, what do I want to do? Boys look outwardly. They, they look, I want that, I want that. Uh, men look inwardly, like, I need to do this. Men say, this is what I need to do. Boys say, this is what I want to do. But I want to move them to a third tier, which I think is most important. It's not the outward look. It's not the inward look. It's the upward look. Mm -hmm. Godly men and women say, what does he want me to do? And so that's my goal at Hillsdale with young men and young women. I want them looking up. I want them to have a vertical look. I don't want them looking out. You, get, you look out, you get, you get your eyes off of Jesus. You look in, like even in, looking in, like, uh, you know, something from Disney. Your heart, follow your heart. <laughs> According to the Old Testament, I mean, Jeremiah chapter 17, he said that the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked above all things. Who can know it? So don't necessarily follow your heart. You better follow the word of God. Um, anyway, um, so... The views and opinions expressed in these remarks are my own. <laughs> they do not represent Hillsdale College. Or, you know, I would think that most of my colleagues would agree with me in, in, in terms of this. I've spent a lot of time reflecting on uh, CRT. Our, uh, I would like to call it a false religion. I mean, I'm just, but I digress. Uh, if I may use the words of St. Jude, I love St. Jude. It's a really short book, and you could say, hey, I read a book of the Bible. It's like 25 <laughs> verses, and you're like, hey. You know. But anyway, I, I love what he said. He said, beloved, um, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, he said, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you must earnestly, like earnestly contend for the faith, which was once and for all delivered unto the saints. And he goes on to, to say, for there are certain men who have crept in unawares. Like they snuck in through the side door. Like I came in through the side door. Nobody saw me. Like they crept in unawares. Who were before ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness. Or as I like to put it, they turned the grace of God into race. See, they, they forgot the G. And they focused on race. I don't know if you know this, but we are from the same race. There's only one, and it's called the human race, right? I, I, I worked in autopsy services in the Navy, and all the autopsies I've done, once you cut past that melanin, everybody looks alike. <laughs> I mean, they all look alike. Uh, so uh, a little bit about myself. I spent 26 years in the United States Navy. Uh, the bedrock of the Navy was honor, courage, and commitment meritocracy, and humility. Like you were, uh, I, I think, what branch are you in, young man? Marine Corps. 
I could say, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Had to be a Marine in the crowd. No, I love the Marines. I've served with Marine units. Uh, I, it's the only branch that calls me Doc, and I didn't go to medical school, so. <laughs> Tell you something about the Marines. No. No, I love my Marines. They certainly had my back, covered my six. Uh, I have a son who's a Ranger. And prior to my son hitting, and pray for our uh, service members, um, prior to my son hitting, he's, he's a Ranger with the 75th Ranger Regiment, and prior to him heading over to Afghanistan, would you believe he spent three hours uh, with a very important talk, topic they had to have? He thought he was getting new. Uh, a new weapon and they were getting some new equipment, but it was on uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Three hours on that. Like, he's going to Afghanistan, and all the people over there care about is that is, he, is, is the flag U.S., and they want to kill him, but they had to spend three hours to learn about diversity, equity, and inclusion because the Department of Defense said that that's the greatest threat to the U.S. military. That's a bunch of hogwash, and I think you would believe, agree with me. Would you not? North, South, if you, okay. Amen. So uh, I, I told you, I went to this school, and I'm like, I got to tell my friends in Ohio. I call you friends. Uh, this. Uh, so listen to this school statement. They had an office. This is the title. The Chief Officer of Belonging. And uh, the Title 10 coordinator, the office is tasked with implementing the blueprint for belonging, overseeing bias reporting, and ensuring that our campus aligns with the Title Nine policy. So just a backstory. This campus, someone etched out on the wall, you may have read about it last year, uh, the N-word, and then they put KKK lives, and then a Jewish star, and 666. Who does that? Like, 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 yeah, they cut all the bases, right? Like, like if you would have saw that, even if you, you have no investi investigative experience, you would go, hmm, right? I mean, come. so they, they did an investigation. But prior to the investigation, people marched on the campus, and they're like, this campus racist, white privilege, white people are racist. Splitting the, splitting the town. After the investigation, they found out it was a black student. <laughs> right? <laughs> so what did the school do? They doubled down. They doubled down, and uh, I think I have, a, I have what they, and they created this policy called the bias reporting system. <laughs> <laughs> and it lists a laundry list of things that must take place. There is a bias reporting team that, were rep that <laughs> you can report, and, and, any, and any report of bias that can be reported anonymously. And then the bias response team will immediately deal with it. There are things that they will do, such as online modules for the person who committed the bias, educational conversations, trainings and workshops, and public statements. Uh, this sounds crazy, right? So as I talk to the business leaders of this town and the city where this college resides, I was struck by the accusations level that the business owners. I sat and listened as one lady said with tears in her eyes as she told me how she was demoralized as a racist and that she was suffering from white privilege. Uh, point. I, I pause to say this, I have privilege. I have brown privilege, there's white privilege. We're privileged to be Americans. <laughs> We're pr all of us are privileged. If you live in the United States, you're so privileged. You're so privileged. Has anybody been overseas? If you've ever been overseas, would you agree that we're privileged in this country? <laughs> and and, I, and I, I, I would love to take the people who think uh, who, who think that only white people are privileged in this country to some other countries, and they'll see how privileged they are. Uh, we're a privileged people. And because we're people of God, we're even more privileged. Amen? Amen. When, when people of color, this is what they are saying, at this, when people of color speak of their experiences of oppression, it's important for white people not to dominate the conversation or question those experiences. You 
can use your privilege to amplify those voices. What? <laughs> that's, that's baloney. If we base policy off of people's experiences, have you ever experienced this? No pun intended. You ever, you ever felt one day like God wasn't close to you as you would want him, but yet he's there? If you base it off your experience, man, you'd be lost as a $3 bill. And there is no $3 bills. So it's not about the experience. It's about the fact, the facts. Uh, so this, this, is not all, this not only helps marginalized people. This, this is what they say. Marginalized people can reach that audience, but also it helps to spread their message from the source rather than through the lens of white people. This is not what the people of God are after. This is not right. And yet, this type of poison will only do what? Divide communities, guys. Divide communities. And I saw this happening in the community that I was visiting. And when I told my friend in this town that I was coming to Ohio to speak against this poisonous religion, as what I call CRT, this is what he sent me via email. He said to tell you guys this. He said, spread the word loud and clear. Let people know that this cancer is only one higher away from taking over any organization. Yeah. Uh, that's kind of scary, right? Uh, and it, so it's important that we are equipped. We are equipped to speak against this ideology or this religion, as I call it. So, but I want to spend the brunt of my time talking to you about critical grace theory. And to say to you, it's not a theory, it's a fact. If you've experienced the grace of God, you are blessed. Critical grace theory is rooted in the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Critical race theory is rooted in Marxist ideology. It's forcing a false identity on white people and black people. And it actually hurts black people more. Uh, in, in a sense that, you know, they, there are people who think that this actually gives them a leg up. It actually keeps them down. So where I grew up at, we used to say it's not about race. It's about grace. It's not about your skin. It's about your sin. Uh, the issues that really divide us is sin, right? What's, what unites us? Grace. The grace of God is what unites us. It's not the color of your skin. And in fact, if you get your identity from your melanin, that's pretty shallow, isn't it? I mean, if you looked at your melanin, how thick that is, not very. I mean, if you want to be a deep person, I wouldn't get it from your melanin. I'm just saying. I'm just, I'm just throwing that out there. Uh, so grace is what will unite us. Uh, look, I used to say this from the outhouse. Anybody ever? Some older folks. You know what an outhouse is. Some of you may still have one. So I don't know. This, so I, as I drove in, you know, it's pretty rural out here. <laughs> if you took offense to that, just say, ouch. From, from the outhouse to the white house to the black house to my house to your house, Jesus saves. And guess what he uses? The grace of God. So when you give your heart and your life to Jesus, you get a brand new identity. Amen? That, that is not after the flesh. Um, my blackness or my whiteness takes a back seat to my identity in Christ, right? Uh, my identity changed when I gave my life to Christ. My identity changed. I, I was grafted into the family of God. Uh, one of the first steps in becoming a new Christian is the discipleship and learning who we are in Christ. We are people belonging to God. We're not victims. We're victors. When I went to this school, there was a lot of victims. Man, victims everywhere. <coughs> we are victors if you are covered under the blood of Jesus Christ. We are people belonging to God. He's called us out of darkness and into what? His marvelous, his marvelous light. His marvelous light. And in fact, as you get closer to that light, you just see how dirty you are. And you want more of his light to reveal uh, as he washes us. Uh, and we should let the world, we should not let the world tell us who we are. And yet there are a lot of people doing that. Uh, how can they define and tell you who you are when they don't know who, 
who they are. Uh, the world is lying in darkness, and people without God, they seem smart. But remember, no matter how much light you give a person, it is God who opens up the eyes of individuals. So you can give them as much light as you possibly can, but it is God that opens up the hearts and minds of men. Um, and he, men cannot see until God opens their eyes. So we, we have a brand new identity in Christ. And guess what? Grace does that. And so, and so it's, it, I, I love the acrostic in the Navy, Marine Corps, all the branches. We have so many acrostic and acronyms. But I love the one for grace. It's God's riches at Christ's expense. That's how you get it, right? You want the riches of God? They come at the expense of Christ. And uh, all the expense of the Savior. And the church should be lining up in battle array against a culture that would define who our children are or who we are in manner of, uh, of, uh, by race. It's not race, but it's critical grace. We must appropriate God's grace. God has redefined who we are by grace. For the believer, you are not the same person you were before you met Jesus. So first of all, I want you to know a little bit about me. Like I said earlier, it was mentioned I was, you know, number 13 or 15, a lot of hand-me-downs, mandatory, <laughs> mandatory hand-me-downs. I grew up during an area of desegregation, so I was bused from an all-black elementary school to an all-white elementary school in a place called Cahokia, where I grew up at. So I've experienced, you know, the stuff that people talk about. You know, by the way, of all the countries in the world, which country talks about race more than any other country in slavery? The United States. We are at nauseum talking about it. Everybody here can remember in high school, in grade school, they heard the stories. We talked about it so much. So it wasn't until I was on a 100,000 tons of democracy, that's a ship, sailing off the coast of India, and I became a Christian, and I experienced this grace that God gives, and I came to faith, and it made a radical change in me. It changed my trajectory. And so I, 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 my, it changed everything about my outlook and where I was going. It changed my compass and my course to true north as I uh, seek to do his will. So, uh, but I, wanna, I want you to know that grace is under attack, though. Why is it under attack? Because the enemy, Satan himself, would have liked us to focus on, what did I say earlier? Starts with an R. Race. race. I mean, he's using that. So he used critical race theory and all these other things for us to focus on that. You see somebody coming from a distance and automatically you judge them based by what they look like. That's not how we, it's not how we operate as believers. We get to know people and we show them the love of God, right? So there are three things that man has no solution for. One of them is sin. Man, has no, man tries to change the, the name of the poison and change the name of the bottle, but it's still a poison. Sin destroys lives. Man has no cure for it. I don't care what the Biden administration comes up with a new stimulus plan. <laughs> Nothing can deal with sin. Man has no cure for it. Would you agree? Yes. Another one is, this is one that will touch all of us. Sin has certainly touched all of us. But the, the other one is sorrow. You've experienced that yet? You will. And unfortunately, there's nothing you can do about it. Sorrow will always be with us. I mean, we, we, can, we, can, we can comfort each other, but sorrow hurts. Boy, does it hurt. Right? Sin, sorrow. And then this is another one. Man has no answer for it. Death. Man has no answer for death. I mean, we try to slow it down, give you some extra drugs, prolong it, but it's coming. It is a point on a man wants to die, and after that, the judgment. But hey, there is one cure for it, the gospel of Jesus Christ. The grace of God is the only cure. And so Satan wants to fight that. And what does he do? He, t he makes good evil and evil good. And so he is, he's come against the very grace that is so freely given. It's ours. God has gave it to us. So Satan wants to fight this grace. And uh, some men in here may have experienced this. Man falls in love with a young lady. 
and he wants to marry her, but he doesn't have enough courage to pop the question. So he gets this idea. He says, uh, I'll buy a beautiful, expensive, solitaire diamond engagement ring. Some of you guys probably just use regular glass. Anyway, <laughs> he said, I'll give it to her as a present and see her reaction. That way, I'll know whether or not she'll be my wife. And so he buys a very, very expensive diamond. And you know, they come in those little boxes, you know, a little fuzzy box with the real nice, with the nice hinges. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Thumbs up if you. I'm saying, I didn't get one of those. He just put the ring in my hand. No. So he wraps it up and he says to her after a very nice date, sweetheart, there's a present for you. I want you to take this home, look at it, and then tell me what you think tomorrow. I know some of you are like already ahead of the story. Like, why would he do that? What, did he ask her that? Yeah, he did all that stuff. <laughs> so he says, I want you to open. I want to see your reaction. So she goes home. She opens the present. Later, he sees her and he says, well, did you like it? And she said, oh, it was so wonderful. I was so thrilled. She said, such fine hinges on the box. And, and just, just beautiful satin and the, and the cloth. And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What did you think of it? What was inside? <laughs> she said, you mean the glass thing with the, with the wire? I threw that away. But I'm so happy to have this wonderful little box. And you say that's ridiculous, but more ridiculous is that people who don't understand that their body is the box, right? Your body is the box, the soul is the diamond. We spend so much time on the box. We spend so much time on the outer exterior, what we look like on the outside. We spend, we spend so much time focusing on race when the diamond's inside. The diamond is what Jesus died for. The diamond is what he's coming back to get. And yet we spend a lot of time pampering and praising the box. We pack the box, but we neglect the soul that lives within the box. Your soul is the diamond that lives in the box. Your soul is of infinite worth. You see, the body may die, but the soul is made in the existence of God will go on and on and on. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah that's what, I mean, it, if that doesn't make sense, you need, to, you need to go back and read God's word. Critical grace theory values the soul of man. And get this, it's free. It doesn't cost anything. Jesus paid it all. All to him we owe, right? Uh, critical race theory values the skin. And that, my friend, is a sin. <laughs> right? Hey, that rhymed. If you, <laughs> if you value the skin, that's a sin. You need to be valuing the soul of individuals. Grace is God's love that causes God to give us where there is no merit. He gives us something where there is no merit. Grace is God's love that causes God to give to us when there is much demerit. Anybody know what a demerit is? Yeah, much demerit, right? And grace is God's love that causes God to give us where there is no merit and much demerit. When we don't even want it, he still gives it. And so, as I said, man has three enemies. What were they? Sin, sorrow, sorrow and death. And there has been no progress made in these areas, would you agree? And yet, there is no answer to these dilemmas other than what? The gospel of Jesus Christ. And so satanic opposition will come in the forms of, look, it's critical race theory this, this semester <laughs> or this time. It'll be something else next time. But our God never changes. He's the same yesterday today and tomorrow or forever, if you use the King James Version. Uh, so, so, I mean, so Satan wants to pervert. He perverts the truth by calling evil good and good evil. 
And there can be no compromise with the truth of the gospel, right? There's no, we're not compromising on God's word. And so we, the church, must not compromise. We must hold our position. We are not compromising. We're, we're not letting the world come into the church and dictate to us what we know he said. And that's what's happening in some churches. They are yielding to this. You got churches like washing people, black people's feet and saying we're sorry and we're sorry and we're sorry again. We need not do that. The church should not bow the knee to the world. The world should be bowing the knee to Christ. Every knee shall what? And every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Um, so this gospel of grace, who brought it? Who paid for it? Jesus. Jesus paid for it. So we said Satan fought it, but Jesus bought it. Hey, that rhymes. <laughs> so Satan fought it, but Jesus bought it. He bought it with his blood, right? Jesus paid the price of this grace gospel with his blood. But guess what? This gospel, grace wrought it. W-R-O-U-G-H-T. I don't use that word that often. Okay, it rhymes, so. <laughs> Jesus bought it, but grace, grace wrought it, right? It's the grace of God that bringeth salvation, right? I mean, you can't have, you, you, you can't appropriate God's grace without placing your faith in Christ. This grace that's wrought comes through faith, right? You got it? I caught it. Okay, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Man, she's on my team. Uh, I, I planted her in the crowd. What's your name again? Oh, it's right there, Molly. So, <laughs> thank you, Molly. So the saving operation of this gospel, this grace wrought it, it's the seeking grace, right? I mean, the grace of God seeks to whosoever will, right? I mean, it sought you, right? You didn't just wake up and say, you know what, I think I'm going to look for grace. No, God's grace found you. Like, it, it's appropriated to you. God gave it to you. You didn't do anything to get it. He gave it to you. It's unmerited. There's nothing you could do to deserve it. He gave it to you. And it's a saving grace. Like, his grace is sure. It saves. That's why I said it's critical that you have this grace. And this ain't no theory. So let's drop the theory. This is a fact. Uh, and it's a securing grace. Like, it secures us. Critical race theory does not secure, it divides. When I went to this town, this town was split apart. You had people at each other's throats, only based on what they looked like. But the grace of God unites us. It doesn't matter what you look like on the outer exterior. I mean, some of you guys could use a lot of help. But that's another <laughs> story. I digress. Uh, and this grace is sufficient. It's all you need is the grace of God. It's sufficient to supply all of our needs, right? And, and, I, and, I, and I close with this because I, I, re, I, I might be going over. No, you're good. Oh, okay. You just came over to Jesus. Okay, all right. Yeah. All right, you guys do that at home. Uh, <laughs> and so Paul taught this. And so it, I would be remiss, if I may, if share with you from Paul's writing, to the Galatians, I like the book of Galatians because he used the word foolish quite a bit of times in our whole <laughs> foolish Galatians. I sometimes say that about the students. Oh, foolish students, who have bewitched you? You know, like, like, like uh, so I'm going to praise God for electronic Bibles, right? Sometimes they're really bad because I love the paper, right? Just something about the paper and electronic Electronic Bibles can make you dumb because, <laughs> you know, they automatically, you just click and go to the book. But with, with the paper, you got to know unless you have the index. Then, you, then, then you're cheating. Uh, <laughs> all right. So this is Paul to, in, uh, to the Galatians. This is verse 9. As we said before, so I say now again, if any man, this is Paul saying this. If any man preach any other gospel unto you that ye have not received, let him be accursed. Uh, 
This is Paul saying this. Well, well, you know what? I, I, I should have said it started in verse 8. But though we, this is Paul again, but though we, Paul said, if I came back and I told you, hey, uh, the grace has something else attached to it. He said, but though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. And then verse 9, he says, as we said before, so I say now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. So he's doubled down. Paul is doubled down. And so Paul taught this, that the grace of God is available to us. And so in dealing with, you know, and I, and I, and I certainly could take questions about critical race theory that you have, and we could talk about this as a fam, Mali, <laughs> trying to get cool like the kids. They just say fam. They need to say the whole word. It's these, short, <laughs> these short and abbreviations confuse me. I thought it was an acronym for something. You know, foreign aerial maneuvers or something. I don't know. <laughs> Fam, family. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. So as, as we take questions about CRT and all of this, it's, it's grace that was, is, is what's going to unite us. And loving people with the grace of God, right, that he gives us uh, is so important. Um, so critical grace is God's love that gives at great, great cost to God himself, right? Amazing grace. You know, the rest, it, it saved a wretch. It's sweet and it saved a wretch like me. Anybody, any place, any time, no matter how wicked, how vile, can come to him in repentance and faith. Isn't that true? Like, and he will in no wise cast them out. Uh, and they will be saved glorious, instantaneously, radically, dramatically, eternally, saved by the grace of God. Not one thing to earn, but there is much to learn. Um, is that wrong? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't mean for that to rhyme. Uh, so, but I, I, I lose track of time, and, and I so appreciate you allowing me to come from the, well, you might not think the great state of Michigan, but coming from Michigan to come here. And I, and I just want to, I want to end this because I do want to take some questions because uh, I want to end this with, back to what Jude said. Uh, Jude said, though I, though I wanted to share with you the common salvation we share, I felt it needful. Uh, to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith, which was once and for all delivered unto the saints. Uh, for unfortunately, there are those that have come in uh, with perverse theologies and doctrines that are, wanting, that are changing the grace of God. Uh, and Paul, we double down. Paul doubled down and said, if anyone comes to you. He said, even if he did it. Paul said, if I came back and told you something different, it says, uh, change 26. You know, we know, you know how it is in the military. We always get a change order. I'm like, hey, we're doing this. Uh, change. But this, this doesn't change. You said if that happens, if an angel came and appeared, that's why, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll have a, I had a student, he says, hey, uh, an angel, he, he saw an, an angel appeared or something. And I, my, my question is like, okay, in light of scripture, does it, does it line up with the word of God? If it doesn't line up with the word of God, I mean, Joseph Smith saw an angel too, right? Angel Moroni showed up with some golden tablets, which I still haven't seen, but, but I digress. But I, I mean, he, Muhammad saw an angel, right? And wrote some, told him to write some, I mean, it, I mean, it's, it's, Satan is what? Called an angel of, yeah, he disguises himself as an angel of light. I mean, so that's going to come. And so this critical race theory that's out there, has duped a lot of people, a lot of good people, too. I mean, you may know somebody that's like bought a hook, line, and sinker. And so, you know, the Bible says that if it were possible, the very elect could be fooled. So if we don't keep our hands in his hands and keep looking vertically. We keep, you keep looking horizontally, you're going to lose focus of him. We, I mean, it's, it's a constant walk and abiding walk with him. 
and we need a vertical look, not a horizontal, not even an internal. Remember that? Don't listen to Disney. Trust your heart. Your heart knows the way. No. <laughs> Some of you are like, wow, he should make a CD. Sounds so good. <laughs> you obviously have a hearing problem. <laughs> I'm going to tell you that right now. So please, uh, I, I love to take some questions that, you know, I like to think I'm an expert on this critical race stuff because uh, I've been washed in the blood of Jesus with critical grace. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so can I do that? First? Absolutely. First of all, thank you. I will keep the questions going, but do want to give you a round of applause for a phenomenal... So you've contended with forces seen and unseen that are vexing because I know you know my son, John Paul. I'm kidding. I love John Paul. I love my daughter, Catherine. Um, a, a, a couple belief and beverages ago, we asked the, I asked the question, give us advice on parenting young adults into adulthood. You are immersed in young adults helping to form them into adulthood. So take the gloves off. You who know in general their souls, every one is different and unique, I get that. But what are some common themes that reoccur in your connecting with them that might help us as parents and grandparents better understand the souls of our kids and how, what they're looking for, what their passions are, and how we really need to enter maybe more fully into the fray? Okay, oh, that's a good question. If, if, I could, if I could use that theme I used earlier about, so, so I think there's four basic looks that most people have. And the first look is the outward look. And I, I find a lot of kids begin to look at other kids like he has it more easy in this subject or he has more friends than I, than I do. Or, you know, so they, they get focused on others. And then you've told them they're the best in since sliced bread and then they meet me and I tell them they're not. <laughs> so you keep telling them that, I'm gonna tell them they're not. So, <laughs> it's a military thing, you know, we break you down. <laughs> Like we, I mean, oh, it's, I look for a kid who thinks they're all that, and I'm, I, I zero in. So I zeroed in on John Paul. I mean, he, I mean, he I'm like, I, I'm like, I don't like you. That's our way of loving each other. We just kind of, and if the kid can't take it, then, you know, I, 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 I learned a little bit about that kid. But the outward look, I see that a lot. They're looking outwardly. And, you know, sometimes as parents, I'm a, I'm a parent, too. I had a son who went to Hillsdale. And my son, son's an Army Ranger. He's been to Afghanistan twice. He was in Syria. Funny thing, I'm in Syria. I'm looking over in the Syria border. I was in uh, Jerusalem. I'm like, man, it looks rough over there. And he, he was actually there, and I didn't know because he has that. I lost my top security clearance, so I can't know what's going on anymore. But I, I serve a God who knows all things, right? And we can get in our prayer closets and, get, and, get, and send those prayer arrows out. And they can, they, can, they can penetrate any defense system that's out there. So do know that. And so as a parent, your prayer arrows, I mean, I, I've seen prayer arrows coming. I mean, I've been hit in the head with a few of them coming into Hillsdale for somebody's kid. So don't underestimate the power of prayer. And remember, where God doesn't rule, guess what he does? He overrules. So you're in a situation, you're like, man, I, you know, I don't know how God's going to do it. Don't worry about it. He can overrule. He can overrule. And so we serve a mighty God. <laughs> I, I heard that day, that baritone, that was like, oh, yeah, we're going to have a contest here to see how low he can go. <laughs> Very simple. You will turn red and I won't. <laughs> so we will know you. So we will have to stop it because he's getting redder. He's not changing colors. No, go ahead. First of all, how long have you been at Hillsdale? Ten years. Ten years. And what have you yes, seen from your first year there to now with some of this garbage creeping into our society? Yeah. So uh, it's, it's good that, you know, we, we've been shielded at Hillsdale from it. Uh, but what, I, what I've been seeing now is, I don't know if you've seen it, but I've been seeing, uh, it was being recorded. <laughs> no. What I've been seeing is like the, the femininity creeping into the young men. So I'm seeing guys with painted fingernails, which I didn't see before. I'm seeing that guys with, you know, that are that are, you know, kind of like uh, really like soft spoken. I'm like, hey, uh, use some, like when you, 
Like, I don't get in a young man's grill. I'm like, hey, what's the deal here? Like, stand up. St put your back. What, what are you doing? You know, you know, I'll hit him even. You know, so, because I care about him. Like, but, but I'm seeing a lot of, lot of femininity that's creeping in to the uh, young men. And, uh, you know, I care about our ladies at Hillsdale. I, I, I don't have any daughters, so I have 750 of them, and they go to Hillsdale College. Catherine's one of my newest daughter, and she's so sweet. Uh, and, and I care about them. And, and so I want them to have some eligible bachelors. Not, not, you, know, we, you know, we need some of those huge uh, families, like, like mine, like 15. You know, number 13 is a good number. The reason I say I was called 13 because my dad got tired of trying to say all the names when some of us got in trouble. And so we'd all get in a corner and he'd just, you know, he'd just reach in and just grab out a number. I'm like, oh, for some reason I got picked a lot. Like, number 13 again. Like, I think it was because I was the youngest and I got pushed to the front. But, but yeah, I, I, uh, I mean, that's, that's what I'm, I'm, I'm seeing that. And, and, I'm, and I'm also seeing a desire for students, and, and let me see if you could try to understand this. Um, look, college is great, and we want students to get an education. It's, it's important. But would you agree that education doesn't save? Mm -hmm. Only Jesus saves. So I don't really, I mean, I don't really care what the student majors in. At the end of the day, when they walk across the stage, I don't want him to leave as a good student either. I want him to leave as a godly man or a godly woman. I don't, I don't, because sometimes if you keep pushing them to be good, they're being good, they're doing it just so that they could please you and be good. Godliness requires a relationship with the living God. You, you gotta be in communion with Christ if you're gonna live a godly life. You can fake good, you can't fake godliness. Because, you know, that, 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 acquire, that requires a relationship, a daily walk with him. That's what I'm after with them. But I'm seeing a lot of kids just, just kind of going through the motions. Like, I'll get them in my office. They don't take their Catholic faith serious. I mean, they, and, and so I, I know when they come to college, it, it's theirs. They have to own it. You can't live, a, I don't want to hear about what mom and dad did in the faith. What are you doing? Like, a lot of them have mentioned you, the parent. I said, so tell me a little bit about your faith. Tell me about it. Well, what happened was you know, my parents, I didn't ask you about your parents. What about you? Like, like, what are you doing? When was the last time you read your Bible? When was the last time you went and worshiped? Well, you know, I'm busy with school. Like, oh, you are? <laughs> so he, God just woke you up like he just wakes you up anyway? And you don't have time for him? Well, see, what happened was, was I... So one of the, one of the yeah. first things that I heard the great chief quoted about was, you need to be more con less concerned with your GPA yeah. and more, more concerned more with... G-O-D, yeah. Yeah, because GPA is, you know, Hillsdale, you know, average ACT score 32. So I, I give this question, I say this to a student. Hey, there was a student that went to Hillsdale College. He was a triple major in, uh, in physics, economics, and math. He was a 4.0, and he went on, he went to Harvard, and he was summa cum laude at Harvard uh, in physics. All the students are like, wow. And then I say, but he did not love God, he did not grow in his faith, and then they're like, oh. But I said, you were excited when I said all of those earthly accomplishments. It really got you going, and you were like, he must be awesome or she must be awesome. But sometimes the definition of failure is succeeding at the wrong things. If, you don't, if, if God isn't first, then everything else doesn't matter, does it? If he's, not, if he's not first place, everything else doesn't matter. And so getting that across to students, like I, I try to get that across to them. I mean, we certainly want them to do well in the school, but at the, not at the expense of their faith. That's why I say, you know, GPA is one thing, but G-O-D, that's what you need to be focusing on, and that is essential. Uh, any, any other? Yes, ma'am. So this town that you went to, yeah. you gave a talk. Yes, ma'am. And how was it received? 
Wow. Uh, so, so actually, uh, there, there's another gentleman game. He gave the talk, and I just accompanied him. And when he, he mentioned uh, that, so, so th this gentleman was in a church in South, South uh, Chicago, which is one of the most dangerous areas. He started a church there. And uh, anyway, he came to this other town we're talking, <laughs> and uh, he said that uh, BLM uh, destroys communities and there's no hope in it, and like seven people got up and walked away. So now we can have a conversation. We got rid of those guys. <laughs> and then he, 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 he said this, which I agree. There's some people you just got to love the hell out of them, right? Yeah. You just got to love it out and squeeze it out of them. Just love the hell out of them, right? Uh, the gospel will do one of two things. And I think uh, he, uh, he, he mentioned a C.S. Lewis quote that I got I to gotta go look at that quote again. But it, it will either draw people toward the Savior or away. Do you guys remember when, uh, I think it's John chapter 6, uh, when uh, Jesus is with the disciples, and uh, he said, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part in me. And when some people heard that, what did they do? They were like, it was, a, it was like a mic drop. Right? They were like, I'm, we're, not, we're not in it, we're not with this. But then he went on and he said, will ye also go away? And what did Peter say? I mean, where, where, so that's the question. Where, where are you going to go? To whom shall we go to, Peter said. Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And remember, Jesus told Peter, hey, now don't think you're all that, because flesh and blood did not reveal that to you. But who did? My Father in Heaven did. And so, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, where are you going to go? <laughs> so when those went away, where are they going to go? <laughs> I, I mean, so it was, it, was, it was received well by some, but not by others. <laughs> not by others. I mean, I, I, I was in constant with, with the, the staff there, and people are being taught this this critical race theory is being taught in, in institutions, in the military. I mean, I, 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 we get a lot of inquiries from Hillsdale, from uh, academy kids. That, well, one of the things they don't like is they don't want to take a COVID. They don't want to. They don't want to take the, the vaccine. Uh, uh, and another one is that the academies are even, you know, buying into this wokeism. Woke used to be a good word. Remember? Are you woke? You're like, yeah, I'm woke. Now it's a bad word. Remember the rainbow was a cool word? Now you're like, oh, I don't have anything to do with that. <laughs> like, like, I like the rainbow. I wanted to wear a rainbow shirt, but I was like, my colleagues would look at me funny. <laughs> I mean, it's a nice color. It's beautiful colors. It's God's promise, yeah. And then they hijacked it. How could you hijack God's promise? We should take it back. We should take it back. We should take back everything that they've hijack from us, but like, who would be the first one to wear a rainbow shirt? <laughs> you guys would be like, hey, tomorrow, are you wearing yours? Uh, <laughs> and one person goes in and it's over. So. Uh, so. Yeah, they wouldn't let us get to the students. It was kind of weird. Um, but, uh, but I was able to talk to a few staff and I'm trying to develop a relationship with them because I do care about other colleges and universities because never everybody can go to Hillsdale, right? I mean, we, we can't let all of our universities fall. Just like we need a good man like that to stay in the Marine Corps. I know his wife was like, oh, I don't want to stay. <laughs> but but we, need, we need godly people everywhere. God forbid if we, it's the only reason why that things aren't as, they could get a lot worse, but because God's people are everywhere. I mean, God's blessing companies and businesses where his people are at, right? He blesses his people. And so because you are where you're at, other people around you are blessed. They get the benefits of that Shekinah glory that God shines on his people. Uh, that was a question over here. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering because most colleges, if you talk about God to the students, you get in mm. big trouble. Yes, ma'am. So this is not a problem at Hillsdale? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> That's awesome. Founded in 1844 by Free Will Baptists with the express purpose of developing the hearts and improving the minds of students. And uh, yeah, I mean, for, Hillsdale has four missions. Uh, for 
first thing is, and, and I think it's, it's succinctly, right, students come to college to learn, right? Not to be deep, not to be programmed, but to learn. And we at Hills, I believe that students should be learning the truth. And unfortunately, like even, and, and you would, if you, you search a lot of Catholic universities or other universities of faith, unfortunately, they're, they're getting woke too. They're buying into this stuff. It's sad. But we believe students come to learn and then they learn truths. And I think when you learn truth, the second, that's one of the pillars at Hills, the second pillar is faith. You're going to run smack dab in the faith. Because as you learn the truth, you should bow to the truth. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Yeah. Good King James Version. Set you free. <laughs> and so faith is a second pillar. And then as God, as you give your, your life and heart to him, and he grows you in your faith, your character is going to change. That's the, sec- the third pillar of the college is character. And then after your character, because we want to produce men and women of character, then you're free. Like freedom is the fourth pillar. So those are the four pillars that hold up the college. And every student has assigned the honor code. Now, the honor code doesn't keep the kids, right? I expect kids who love God, they don't need an honor code. I mean, they, they walk in the spirit. So that, that they, they're above the, a code, but we have all kids sign it because not all kids are walking in the spirit. So I was like, is this your signature on this document? <laughs> okay. Now, call your mama. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so we can talk because we also believe in partnership. College means partnership. We appreciate your prayers first and foremost for our ministry, and secondly, um, any sort of partnership that you feel called to enter into with us. We also appreciate that, and it is needed, and we are blessed by it. We just try to provide the tools to help marriages and families and to become more true disciples of Christ in that. So check it out, ilovemyfamily.us. There's a partner button on there. Feel free to take it home. If you're already a partner, which many of you are, we are so grateful. Um, If you know somebody who would be open to joining us also, feel free to take a sheet.